You know how sometimes like a tiny detail can suddenly make you see a much bigger picture? Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of what happened with Kesser and Steen, these two students who were clearly pretty observant. Right. A chance encounter with a rare beetle, the Boyerton, uh, which we'll mostly call the stag beetle today, has sent us on this really fascinating exploration. And it all started with something you, our listener, actually shared with us. Precisely. Yeah. You told us about Kesser and Steen from their nature and innovation class and how seeing this one beetle um, really brought home the reality of habitat loss for them. Yeah. And, you know, it sparked this amazing idea to actually create a new habitat, like right in their own backyard. Yeah. That's a great example, isn't it? Even small creatures matter. It really is. Now, habitat loss, it can feel like this huge sort of abstract problem sometimes. Definitely. But what's so great about Kesser and Steen's story is how, well, how grounded it is. It started with just seeing something, and it led to a really tangible, hopeful idea. So, in this deep dive, we're going to get into the world of this Brujort, you know, understand what it is, the specific threats it faces that Kesser and Steen actually saw, and their really creative plan to help these beetles out. There are some genuinely surprising things here. Okay, so let's start with that first moment, right? Kesser and Steen are in the woods, which sounds like something they do often. Right. And they bump into an older woman who says she's just spotted a Bergeort. Now, what I found interesting was Kesser's first reaction. Skepticism. Yeah, a bit. You know, wondering if maybe she got the trees mixed up, like beech instead of oak. Because, well, both trees are common there. It's sort of a natural mental check. It is. Yeah, it's relatable, isn't it? Your brain just tries to slot things in. But this is where Steen jumps in. Exactly. Quick phone search. Google to the rescue. Uh and boom, visual proof. Steen shows Kesser photos, um, likely those excellent ones by Biolog Anders mentioned in the source, showing this Boyorton is definitely not the Jordan, the oak stag beetle. Seeing the difference right there must have been convincing. Oh, absolutely. It really shows how, like, easily accessible info can just challenge what we think we know, right? It does. A good reminder to stay curious. Okay, so let's properly introduce this beetle. The Danish name, Bojorten, literally translates to stag beetle. Because of the antlers. Precisely. Those mandibles. We'll get to those. And you might also see its scientific name, uh, Dorcas Parallelopipedis. Bit of a mouthful. Okay, so Dorcas Parallelopipedis. What does this stag beetle, this Bojorten, look like? Well, the adults, they're not huge about two to three centimeters long. So roughly an inch. Yeah, around that. And yeah. they're distinctly black. The most noticeable thing, though, is definitely those mandibles, those big jaw-like things at the front. Right, the stag part. Right, exactly. And that's where you see a big difference between males and females. The males, they have these really large, impressive mandibles. They're fighting. Yep, exactly like deer antlers. They use them to fight off other males. The females, though, their mandibles are smaller but interestingly, much stronger. Stronger? Why is that? For chewing through wood, presumably for egg laying. And fascinatingly, even when they're larvae, you can apparently tell the females apart. They have these visible creamy white fatty bits, the ovaries, that you can actually see through their skin. Wow. Okay. That's detailed. It really is. And these larvae, they stick around for a while, don't they? They certainly do. They spend several years living inside dead wood. Just munching away. Pretty much. Mm. Feeding on the decaying wood, growing through three different larval stages, mm. getting bigger each time. Then eventually they pupate. Right, the transformation stage. Mm -hmm. They build this little chamber, like a cocoon, but made of wood bits and soil. And inside that, they change into the adult beetle. And once they're adults, they don't live quite as long. Relatively speaking, no. Their main adult activity period is in the summer, say, May to August. That's when they're most active. Flying around. <laughs> yeah, mostly at night. Flying to find new places to live, new food sources. But you might also see them just crawling around on the ground or on dead logs during the day sometimes. Okay. And it was interesting that the source mentioned you could find adults in dead wood all year round. Does that mean different generations overlap? It really suggests that, yeah. Multiple generations likely coexisting in different life stages within that same dead wood habitat. It's a crucial point. So speaking of habitat, what's their ideal home? It's all about dead wood, right? Absolutely. Decaying wood is key. They really like dead stumps, fallen tree trunks, and the bigger branches that have come down. And mostly beech trees, hence the name. Beech is definitely a favorite, yes. Big Jordan. But they're not only found in beech. They can also live quite happily in other deciduous trees like oak, ash, even apple trees. So they have preferences, but they're a bit adaptable too. Seems so. But it's not just any dead wood. They're oh. quite particular. Oh, 
What kind do they prefer? They really go for what's called white rotted wood. White rotted. What's that mean? Okay, so think of wood decay having different types. Brown rot mainly breaks down cellulose, leaves stuff crumbly and brown. White rot, though, it breaks down lignin. That's the tough stuff holding wood fibers together. Ah, okay. So it leaves the wood looking whitish, maybe a bit stringy. And it seems this is easier for the larvae to digest. It's like their food is pre-softened. Makes sense. And what's also really interesting is a possible link with certain fungi, especially bracket fungi. You know, those shelf-like fungi you see? Yeah, yeah. Well, one called Tramides versicolor, it's often quite colorful, seems like it might be a really important food source for both the larvae and the adults. Wow, so the fungus helps break down the wood? And maybe the beetles eat the fungus too? It seems possible, yeah. It shows this whole interconnected system, doesn't it? Remove the dead wood and you affect the fungi, you affect the beetles. It all links up. It really does. And it explains why we don't see them often, right? Nocturnal, hidden inside wood. Exactly. Yeah. Which brings us right back to Kesser and Steen's observations. This is where the connection to the threats they face gets really clear. Right. Kesser noticed people basically vacuuming the forest floor. That was his term, yeah. Vacuuming it for firewood. And not just people grabbing a few sticks, but this trend of buying pre-dried wood in bulk, too. Meaning a lot more wood is being taken. That's the implication. A widespread removal of dead wood from forests. Kesser's point was stark. Almost nothing is left behind. And that's the beetle's home and food source gone. Exactly. It directly impacts creatures like the Bajortan that need that dead wood for their entire life cycle. In Steen's comment, the palms fritta zone. Ha, ah, yeah. It's such a vivid phrase, isn't it? It really is. This idea of nature being overly neat, too tidy, almost like, well, perfectly cut fries instead of a natural messy forest floor. It lacks that essential decay. It's funny, but also kind of sad. It really highlights how we try to impose tidiness everywhere. It does. And for Kesser and Steen, this was the light bulb moment, wasn't it? Yeah. Suddenly, they understood why they'd never seen this beetle before. Not because it was totally gone, but because its home was disappearing. That's a powerful realization. And what's great is what they did next. They didn't just feel bad about it. They wanted to do something. The backyard habitat idea. Exactly. Let's help the beetles by creating a small habitat. And Oma's eco-friendly backyard sounded like the perfect spot. I love that. Taking action. And they were smart about it, too. They talked to an expert, Biology Anders. Right. Got proper advice. Yeah. And while he was advising them, they were apparently sketching designs. That's real engagement. Totally. So what kind of practical advice did the biologist give? Things we could potentially do, too. Yeah, definitely. A key thing he mentioned is that these beetles, they don't tend to travel very far from where they emerge as adults. Okay, so they're quite local. Very. Which means if their immediate area lacks that dead wood, they're stuck. So creating habitats locally is super important. You can't just build one miles away and expect them to find it. Right. Makes sense. And the wood needs to be touching the ground. Crucial point. Direct contact with the soil. It's important for the larvae, which sometimes go into the soil, and also for the females laying eggs. So leaving an old tree stump in the garden is actually a good thing. A really good thing. Yeah, instead of grinding it out, just leave it. It can become a cool natural feature and a beetle home. Nice. And uh, obviously, no pesticides, right? Absolutely essential. Awesome. Avoid pesticides. They harm way more than just the pests. Mm. And a couple of other simple tips. Go on. Like putting a stick or some stones in water buckets. Oh, yeah. Why? Just so if any small insects, beetles included, fall in, they have a way to climb out. Simple grounding prevention. Huh. Never thought of that. And another one, be careful with landscape fabric, that black weed blocking stuff. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, beetles emerging from the ground can get trapped underneath it and die. Oh, wow. Okay. That's a hidden danger. What if you, like, accidentally dig up some larvae, say, taking out an old fence post? Good question. If you find larvae in wood you have to remove, the best thing is to carefully dig a hole elsewhere in your garden. Put the larvae in there, along with some of the original rotting wood. Okay. Then just cover it loosely with soil. You're basically trying to relocate their little home environment. Got it. And thinking about Kesser and Steen's plan for Oma's yard, 
that idea of a vertical log pyramid. Yeah, that sounds like a really neat solution, especially for smaller gardens. It stacks the necessary dead wood vertically, creating habitat without taking up loads of space. Mm. Seems perfect for what they were planning. It really ties it all together, doesn't it? From seeing the beetle, understanding the problem, to designing a solution. Mm. The main thing here really is how vital that decaying wood is. It's not just waste. Exactly. It's habitat. It supports fascinating creatures like this bird, Jordan. And Kesser and Steen show that you know, even small actions in our own spaces can help. It really does make you think about your own backyard or local park, doesn't it? What could I do? Mm -hmm. Which leads us to that final thought for you, listening today. Just take a moment to reconsider those messy bits of nature. Yeah, the fallen logs, the leaf litter, the untidy corners. Exactly. Think about the amazing life they support. And maybe look around your own environment with new eyes. What other little things, maybe things you haven't noticed before, could be vital homes for unseen creatures? It's about observation, isn't it? Just like Kesser and Steen. Observe, learn. And maybe, just maybe, be inspired to act. Learning about nature isn't just passive. It can lead to a deeper connection and maybe making a real difference, even a small one. You know how sometimes, like, a tiny detail can suddenly make you see a much bigger picture? Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of what happened with Kesser and Steen, these two students who were clearly pretty observant. Right. A chance encounter with a rare beetle, the Boyerton, 